Hey guys, JR here. Before we get into the episode, I want to talk to you again about the Basic Collection from Highly Clutch T-Shirts. Their basic tees are butter soft and have a bespoke fit. They're pre-laundered so your tee doesn't shrink after the first wash, and they feature a classic side seam for added structure. Go to HighlyClutch.com and click on the Basics tab at the top of the page to shop the entire collection. They have three packs of tees, the blues, the black collection, the all-whites, and the bright three pack. I'm partial to the blues and the all-white. So head to HighlyClutch.com and shop the Basics collection. If you like tees as much as me, these are the tees for you. And now enjoy this week's episode of Oh Yeah, Oh Yeah, The Entourage Podcast. For sneakers. Vince, these ain't just sneakers. These are limited edition Fuki Jamas. Fuki what us? Ah, Vince, you know, sometimes you're so cultureless. Tell me I've got juice. Go ahead, tell me that I've got juice. Welcome back, everybody, to Oh Yeah, Oh Yeah, The Entourage Podcast. I am your host, J.R. Hickey, coming to you from San Francisco, California. And we are back, breaking down another epic, iconic episode of Entourage. For those who might be new to the podcast, every Monday morning we break down a new episode of the show. Every week I have a guest on. I try to make my guests as custom as possible for the episode that we're discussing. And this week... I have sneakerhead, YouTube personality, actor, and rapper Jacques Slade on. He is at Custo on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Guys that over a million subscribers. He's deep into the sneaker game. He taught me so much about just sneakerhead culture, how it's changed in comparison to the show. The man's been working in Hollywood, in movies, and TV for years. He had a cameo role in Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story. He's currently the music producer for Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Super talented, super generous with his time. Glad we got him on. So make sure you give him a follow and check out his stuff. This was another great episode, another great conversation. If you're as bit of a fan of the music of Entourage as I am, make sure that you are subscribed to the Oh Yeah, Oh Yeah Spotify playlist. I'm not allowed to play the music from the show on this episode because of copyright laws, but I've compiled all the songs that we discuss into a playlist. The link to listen to that is in the show notes of today's episode. Thank you everyone who's been leaving five-star reviews. I've gotten a few new ones that are super positive. I'm glad everyone's loving the show. We're rounding the bend. We have one more episode in this 3A first part of season three. Don't forget to follow the social accounts at oh yeah Pod on Instagram and Twitter, and follow me if you're so inclined, at JR will do it on Instagram and Twitter. So without further ado, let's talk the Fruity Jamas with Jot Slade. <laughs> All right, guys, we are back. This week's guest is an actor. He's a rapper. He's a YouTube personality, and most importantly, for this podcast episode at least, he is a big-time sneakerhead. My man does sneaker drops, unveilings, and custom releases all over his Instagram and his YouTube channel, which currently has over 1 million subscribers. Jot Slade, welcome to the Entourage Podcast. Oh, man, that's, I, I need this introduction all the time. Jeez, <laughs> goodness gracious. <laughs> Pumping you up on a Wednesday morning. I'm saying thank, thank you for having me, and thank you for the intro. I'm done for the day. All right, that's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> let's, let's go that's home. That's it, man. <laughs> Super excited to talk about this week's episode, episode 11 of season three. What about Bob? The main plot of this episode is E, Ari, and uh, Bob going around the studios trying to sell this Ramones project. But the underlying subplot or, or the secondary plot of this episode is, is what I really want to focus on today. And yeah. not going to lie, I'm, I'm not a sneakerhead. I admitted that to you offline. I'm really excited to dive into some of the sneaker culture stuff, talk about the Futuyamas, and get your opinion on all of that. Awesome. Before we do that, though, what was your experience with Entourage like? When did you first start watching the show? Did you watch it all the way through when it aired? Gosh, I, I don't remember exactly when I first started watching it. I know I think I was at least a season or so in when I started, uh, but then I ended up watching it all the way through. Definitely, uh, definitely got hooked on it after that first episode I saw. Yeah, and what was your like? What was your opinion of the show? Obviously, if you watched it all the way through, like you, you liked it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I definitely enjoyed the show. It's like it's one of those things where you know. For me, like wanting to be to be a big rapper and all that stuff, you kind of mm -hmm. look at that as like, okay, that's kind of how life's going to be. Uh, you know that it's you know that it's not totally true, but yeah. you get a you get a feel for it as like that's what it, that's what life is like at that level, you know. And so like you want to you want oh like oh how do I how do I get there? At a minimum, how do I become turtle? 
Like <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there is some wish fulfillment involved with it, where they're all like fantasies of like those roles in a celebrity's. Yeah. There are turtles out there, but they're not. They're not as turtle as turtle is. You know, that, he is just at this point world class mooch. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But we love it. We absolutely love him. Well, uh, let's dive in. Let's talk about this episode. Uh, this episode aired episode 11 of season three the second to last episode in the first part of season three uh season three was famously cut in half by the writer's strike it aired on sunday august 20th 2006 just a few weeks later in early september jacques you'll appreciate this as a musician the second studio album from a singer songwriter named justin timberlake was released entitled future sex love sounds oh. aside from earning numerous best of the decade lists the album received several grammy award nominations including album of the year and best pop vocal album it's been certified multi-platinum worldwide sold over 10 million copies with 4 million in the united states it's been added to the rock and roll hall of fame's musical library and archive that was a great drop at the end of the summer do you remember that like going into the winter like i i just remember listening to that in college and pretty much on repeat yeah the, Ju- the justin vibes were strong <laughs> oh, 100 <laughs> percent. Let's do a quick recap of this week's episode and let's d- dive into our favorite moments and then ad- eventually let's get to the sneaker stuff. So Okay, let's do it. In this week's episode, Eric Ari and Bob Ryan take the Ramones project to the studios, but Ari and Bob soon find themselves at odds over how to pitch the biopic. After a spectacular failure of a meeting, E gets Bob to agree to let Ari take the lead in the next one. Ari instead sends Bob to the Ron studio to get him out of the way. It's the first day of shooting on Drama's new pilot, and the oldest Chase brother finds himself in the throes of a panic attack. Drama disappears into his trailer to take matters into his own hands, forgetting that he's still mic'd up. (laughs) Though the entire crew learns of Drama's relaxation technique, he nails the scene completely. Turtle sets out to store some Futijamas, a pair of Red Hot limited edition sneakers. Vince accompanies him on his quest, but refuses to play his celebrity card and cut the line, so they come up empty-handed. Vince cuts up a solution. He offers the graffiti artist $20,000 to design a custom pair exclusively for Turtle. Ari quickly drums up interest in the Ramones picture at Universal. There's just one hitch. After realizing he's been led astray, Bob paid a visit to his friend Alan at Warner Brothers, the very studio that blacklisted Vince and sold him the script. Man, these episodes are getting more and more dense every time I do one of these. Um, Yeah. Jacques, what was your favorite moment overall from this episode? Uh, Gosh, there's there's a couple. Um, I can relate to the uh, older Chase brother panic attack. Not that, I, <laughs> not that I've ever uh, solved it that way, um, <laughs> but could definitely relate to the panic attack. I can relate to to the standing in line and waiting for for shoes. Like that's obviously a, a, a true to life moment. And sure. um, again, and then the very there's a very first scene in the episode when they're all together. I believe they're in a kitchen. I believe they're in the kitchen. Just like the camaraderie there in that scene. Oh, like yeah. It reminds me a lot of like me, my friends and I when we were in college and we were all together. It, it very it resonates with me definitely because that's just how like that's how we were with each other. Like it's like good luck on your thing today. But like <laughs> we're definitely going to rib you about it. Like we want you to, yeah. we want we want the best for you. But we're going to definitely let you know that that you ain't nobody. So. <laughs> don't don't yeah. don't feel yourself too much if you get this job. Busting each other's balls a little bit. Absolutely. Drama's like, what do you think? Five button Dolce, too edgy? Well, just right. Depends. You shoot in the pile or serving finger food? Don't give me a hard time today, Total. Please. Yeah, he's all yeah. fired up because he's nervous. Yeah, exa- absolutely. Like that, like that, that is just like that's me and my friends in college. Like I'm still friends with those guys till today. Yeah. And that scene is no different than it was when we were in a college dorm or when we see each other at a barbecue. So <laughs> I think that's why most, you know, young men in America identified with the show is they kind of saw a real life depiction of what it's like to be a group of guys, yeah. which uh, we'll, we have, our next category is bros being bros. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But my favorite moment, it's it's a small one. I mean, I guess my favorite moment in terms of a bid moment this episode is when we see drama acting for the first time in the Five Towns pilot. Nobody went up there and told you nothing. It's not the same anymore. It's different now. It's not just happening over there, it's not just happening over there, it's happening here. It's happening everywhere. All three of them went boom, 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 one after the next. He's good. I'm not just gonna stand around and let that happen to nobody. Not in my town. Not in any of my five towns. We'd never seen him, like, act successfully before. True. Up until this point, we'd seen him, like, 
flub a line, you know, <laughs> uh, creep out Brooke Shields in a in a scene, you know, blow an audition. But this was the first time we saw him like locked in, and it was great. Obviously, the you know the comedic twist at the end is like the reaction shots where Eddie Burns tells him that he was mic'd up when he was uh, doing his thing in his trailer. So just that whole scene is is just really nice and and uh. uh Really kind of cool to see, I think, in uh, in season three of Entourage. You're, you're getting the understanding that while Johnny Drama is a comedic character, he might actually be okay at this acting thing, right. which uh, was nice. Right, and and like and it tells a little bit more. Uh, shout out to uh, it, it tells a little bit more of that whole Hollywood story of like all yeah. these incredible actors, and like you see so many actors in L.A., but because there's so many good actors in L.A. as well, but uh, a lot of them just don't get the chance or get the opportunity to really show show their skills. Truly. And then right afterwards, he like changes his tune. He's playing pool with the guys. He's like, you know, the guy's a genius. He'll do whatever he's got to do to get it on film. And you know what? You were right. Your method works. Next time anxiety rears its ugly head, I'm just going to beat it back down. Immediately while he was a, a complete mess on set, bounces back. Yeah. And that's what's kind of so uh, appealing about Johnny Drama. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like he 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 is like the, the L.A. actor that like works in that works as a, as a waiter and is trying to get on and gets a small part here, a small part there, and has to keep on trying to get it and finally gets gets their break. So, like, I really appreciate him. Every week we talked about a bros being bros moment, Jot. It's it's not like bro in terms of, like, the 2019 connotation. It's just more like those moments of brotherly love. You kind of mentioned yours at the top, you know, th- them busting each other's balls when drama walks in. Did you have any other ones? Uh, the other one would be at the – I think it's the end, the end – yeah, the end of the episode when they're all in the car – and yeah. <laughs> uh, he, they're trying to like they're trying to figure out how much he paid for the shoes. Five thousand, mm, a little bit more for sneakers. Five thousand two hundred fifty, a little bit more. Jesus Christ, for sneakers, Vince, you need mental help. They're not just sneakers, E. They're wearable art. Besides, the joy the turtle's feeling right now is worth every penny. Five thousand five hundred, a little bit more. Christ. For me, like that brought back memories of me and my boys, and to be like, "Oh, I took this girl out to dinner. Where'd you guys go? Ble- oh, blankety <laughs> blank. Oh, like how much was that? Ah, uh, wasn't wasn't that bad. And it's like, <laughs> what's what's not that bad? Like, what, like what, does that, what does that mean? Yeah, drama's going up by increments of like five hundred bucks. He's like five thousand, five thousand five hundred, right? Six thousand. Right. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a nice moment. Yeah, it's a good moment. We'll get into the the sneaker drop and undefeated and like the people lined up outside. But I liked in terms of bros being bros, like. Vince goes with Turtle to Undefeated, and then he decides not to use his celebrity status to cut the line. But then he decides that I'll still wait with you, though, which is in a weird way he's like teaching Turtle a lesson while also entertaining one of Turtle's interests that Vince has no interest in, which, which I liked. It was just like you could tell, at least in the context of the show, that they're truly friends, which, I, right. which was nice. But it's an unwritten law in America. Bring a movie star, go right to the front of the line. Turtle, are you nuts? These people will kill us if we cut. Ah, they'll be thrilled just to get a glimpse of you. I'm not cutting, Turtle. Let it be a man of the people, Aquaman. Vince, these are limited. Back of the line, Turtle. You're lucky I'm even willing to wait. I can't tell you how many dumb things I've gone to with my friends. I'm like, I don't really give a fuck about this, but like, why not? I'll go sit at this, you know, minor league baseball game or something uh. like that. <laughs> <laughs> or, or even, or even worse, being like, oh, she has a friend. You should come. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> being that guy for your boy. <laughs> yeah. Been there. Yeah. What was your least favorite moment in this week's episode? Um, my least favorite moment, I think it was the um, when the same thing when Turtle went to go pick up the shoes. You know, as a sneaker guy, uh, I have this, you know, I guess this an eye for like situations like that where they they make sneakers feel dangerous. And I felt like they kind of did that a little bit when... Um, when Turtle got out of the car to go pick up the shoes and they had the guys outside lifting weights or whatever it was they're doing, <laughs> like to give that, to make it feel threatening. Yeah. So like, that's kind of, that kind of hit me the wrong way, but like, but you know, it, it's, it's, that's, you know, it's part of the Hollywood lore. I get it, but it's just like, ah, it's not like that guys. Yeah. And we'll talk, well, we have a category coming up called like, you know, what would be different about this episode in 2019. That's just a bunch of like, I'm not calling all sneakerheads dorks, but it's a bunch of dorks <laughs> in right, line. Right. Like, wait, it, you're not, you're not going to get a bunch of Dane Banners with like, their, their fucking, right. That's a great, great observation. Yeah. I, I, I could see why being someone as cultured as you in the sneaker game, like it, it just kind of rubbed you the wrong way. A hundred percent. Yeah. I want to bring up the guy who worked at the undefeated in Santa Monica 
he really, really, really wanted his sister to have a nice birthday party, which I thought Man. was really weird. <laughs> That's aw- no, I, it's awesome. Like, like here's the thing, though. Like, those guys that work at those shops, they have power. You know what I mean? Because like, sneaker sneakerheads are trying to get their hands on those shoes. Like, they are trying their hardest to get their hands on those shoes. So a lot of those guys, uh, unbeknownst to us, they have a little bit of power, especially when it comes to, like, yo, can you hold that poor pair for me? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I can. But, like, what you going to do for me? Like, like yeah. that's, there's a there's a term in sneaker in the sneaker world called backdooring. Oh um, yeah, where they feel like shops are giving shoes kind of away to like celebrities and holding them for friends and stuff like that, or reselling them themselves. And like this kind of leans into that a little bit of of that sort of power that they have because they have access to this stock and it's such a high or a hyped item that people want it and people will do anything to get their hands on it. So that, that scene definitely plays into that. And I think it's, I think it's dope that they used that they had the storyline be like something for his sister. Cause it could have <laughs> been, it could have been something a lot, a lot less deep. It could have been like, Oh yeah, I want to, I want to get a BMW or I want to try and get this. Like it was, it was like, yo, I want, I want to do this to make sure my sister has a good birthday party. So I thought that was really dope. He's being a good older brother. It was a yeah. little weird, but, I mean, that's that's what Vince and Turtle were trying to do. They're trying to backdoor the line at undefeated. Fifteen hundred dollars cash in your pocket when I arrive. Here you go. Hey, Vince. I can't take your money, man. But if this is really you, my sister, man, she's a huge fan of yours. If you were to show up at a birthday party, take a few pictures with her and her annoying friends, man, it'd be like your family. I could never say no to family. Your shoes are cool. The coolest. <sighs> All right, fine. You got a deal. Nice. But you still gotta hurry. Because the people find this hidden back here, they're going to tell me a lie. All right, thanks. This episode shined a really interesting light. Is Was this, let me, let's just take a step back and let's talk about this a little bit, Jack. Like, was this the first time you'd seen sneaker culture represented on, like, mainstream television? You know, that's a good question. Um... I'm sure I'm sure it wasn't the first time. I'm sure I had seen it before, but I, I, nothing comes to mind right away. But I'm, I feel like I've had to have, have seen it before, before that moment. Was it done well, though? Was it properly represented to you? Did you feel seen in this? I'm just curious. I have no sneaker game, dude. I, I ah. got a track in college. <laughs> I have a bunch of old track shoes for, like, <laughs> for like my sneakers. So like, That's, that works, though. That's just as good. It, it does. I feel, like, I feel like this was a good representation of, uh, like, a legitimate sneakerhead uh, on a mission to try and get a pair of kicks like this felt this this felt like how it felt back then um, trying to get a pair like having to stand in line or wait in line overnight uh, in order to get a pair or finding out where they're dropping or yeah. having relationships at a shop so you are able to get a pair because you shop there a lot or showing up early in the morning and it's yeah it was it was it was very very legitimate. There must be something thrilling about the adventure and the hunt of it, right? There must be something so satisfying about copping a pair that, like, not many people have and just being able to open it on your own and or, and or show it off to your your friends, right? I mean, I can imagine oh, yeah. at least. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. That's I mean, that that part of the game is missing these days because everything is online. Sure. Um, but that was a big part of it back then. It's like, hey, finding out where they are and getting a couple friends and you guys, you know, that are into sneakers as well. And then you guys, you know, heading to camp out in line, going really early or going going the day before. Uh, I've met like sneakers. Sneakers has brought me some of my like best friends and later on in life just from like the relationships that you form because like you're in line with somebody for hours and you know you start chopping it up and yep. you know next next thing you know you guys are exchanging phone numbers and hanging out that is so cool it's like your own little entourage episode yeah. <laughs> there you go there you go <laughs> uh well we'll get back to the categories but i have one last question for you what's the latest or longest you've tamped out for a, a sneaker drop so i've only done it for i believe four or five hours i haven't done any of the overnight stuff okay I think that's probably smart. I don't know yeah. if I could camp out on a sidewalk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've never, I've never camped out on a sidewalk like the full with the full tent and everything like that. Though I feel like uh, I probably need to just to kind of ratify my uh, my my sneakerhead credentials. Oh, that, interesting. Like, that's part of it. Like you need to be able to like, yeah, yeah, I camped out. Like, yeah, 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 I've yeah. done it. Like your yeah, your badge of honor kind of. Yeah, cool. exactly, exactly. Do it like, and then turn it into yeah. Post on YouTube, do some Instagram stories from it, just to prove to everyone. <laughs> yeah, turn it into a video. Like, yeah, it's 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 my Girl Scout badge that I can tie knots, <laughs> uh, but it's that I camped out. <laughs> Let's do favorite lines or quotes from this episode. Any jump out at you as being particularly good? Uh, was there a crazy line in this one? Um, I mean, every Ari line is amazing. Oh, yeah, but I can't think of anything that really stuck out that okay. that 
like a quotable like I, I can't think of a quotable from there yeah yeah and there weren't any iconic quotes in this episode so you may be right there's some really good fired up ari lines about this whole meeting situation yeah, yeah. that keeps going sideways <laughs> ari's like yelling at e before they walked in when he's like oh i invited bob ari's like tell me you did not call bob we have enough problems with the studio as it is, all right? I don't need this old fuck keeling over right in the middle of my flow. It's his project, all right? That's exactly why he doesn't need to be here. What? He's protected. It's yeah. very true that, like, this is what Ari does for a living, and he's good at it, and he's just rattled by the fact that there's this, like, out-of-touch, rambling old man who, like, doesn't know how the game is played in the middle of his meeting, so... I weirdly, while what Ari did was a dick move by, like, abandoning Bob, I don't hate the move because ah. he sold the movie. Like, I don't know. It's, you know, Hollywood is cutthroat, man. Like, it is. if my agent was like, hey, I sold the movie, but I had to kind of, like, bail on the producer in the in the interim, I'd be like, great, man, he sold the movie. Thanks. That's what I want my agent to do. Like, I don't know. What do you think about all that? Yeah, I mean, I guess, and, and then this is, like, this is the part of Hollywood that you hate. You know what I mean? This is like the the like cutthroat, do anything at all cost, like no matter how, no matter what it costs, kind of kind of thing. Like you want like you want somebody like that, but also like you also want to respect you know the the history that that Bob brought to the game, and you know you want to you want to kind of honor that. And I feel like by ditching Bob to go to Disney, I kind of was like ah. Yeah, like, I get why you're doing it, Ari, but like you could have did it another way, kind of thing. One hundred percent. I'm not saying that like I would do that or that like, I'm, I'm I approve, but I, I almost kind of respect the hustle a little bit of Ari, and that's that's what he does in this show. He goes all out to get whatever his uh his primary client wants. Yeah. One more quick line that I really liked was um, as they're driving to Santa Monica, Vince and Turtle, Vince gets off the phone with the diet undefeated and he turns to Turtle oh, and he says, yeah, 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 say, yeah. I have juice. say I have juice. Win? Say I have juice. Go ahead. Come on, say it. You have juice, Vince. <laughs> All right, good. Hurry up. Santa Monica. Which I kind of liked because you rarely see any cockiness from Vinny Chase. Right. But but I think among friends, that's, that's a totally different thing. That's That's just like friends being like, no, like hundred percent. I did it. I did it for you. Like now you owe give me, me some credit. Essentially, yeah, give me right? some credit. Like, Just a little bit. I like that. Jot, you're a big time musician. You've worked as a musical producer for movies, TV. Uh, there was some great music in this episode, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's always good. They, they did a great job. Whoever the music supervisor was on this show did a great job at picking songs. Just in just in general, like not even just for this episode in particular. I always felt like this episode. I mean, the show had like relevant music, like to the times and also to the scene. It wasn't just like a lot of times you'll get people that'll just throw music in because it's cool and it doesn't yep. necessarily fit the scene. Um, but but the the music supervisor for Entourage was was pretty on point for this. Dot Venner at Broke Dot Mogul Venner. on Instagram and Twitter. He's he's an incredible follow, and he's always uh, announcing and releasing new artists' music that you've never heard of before. Did any uh, did any songs jump out at you as being you know stand out? Uh, yeah, Ride Slow when oh, they're yeah. like rushing over, and but he's playing Ride Slow. It was like ah, oh, that's that's perfect. Like that's perfect. I don't, only other thing if he would have played like Fast Car by uh, which I can't think of the Tracy name. Chapman. Uh, Tracy <laughs> Chapman. Yeah, like that would have been the only other. That's the only other option in my mind. There was a couple good ones. A lot of good hip hop. Yeah, Drive Slow by Kanye. Down and Out featuring Kanye by Tamron as they pull up to the uh, Santa Monica undefeated, and then yeah. As they're driving to Fukuyama's, like, whatever his studio, his warehouse, Throw Some D's by Rich Boy is playing. Oh, my God. That is the remix of Throw Some D's on it is an incredible song. It has Andre on it. Like, Andre has a verse yeah. on it. And it's, it's crazy. But what's so awesome about this song being in this episode of Entourage, and this is, all, again, all the credit goes to Scott Venner, that song was released just five days earlier. No! So it's just another example of Entourage debuting a hip-hop song on its show on Sunday night, and then it hits number 37 on the Rolling Stones list of the 100 best songs of that year. Went platinum. This is back when, like, you. this is how you launched music, was on TV and film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and Rich Boy, Rich Boy had had a vibe going at that time too. Sure. So he was already kind of bubbling up. So it, it's dope that 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 uh that you said Scott Venner that Scott uh, Scott Venner, yeah, yeah that that he uh that he kind of took note of that. Like, yeah, throw some D's on it was, and I mean, well, Rich Boy in general, just he he was really hot at the moment, and I think the producer is um not not Timberland, um uh, Palau de Don. <laughs> oh yeah, Polo Polo de Don. Polo, Polo de Don. Don. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Polo to Don. He was he was really hot 
at the nice. moment too. Like he done some stuff with uh Kerry Hilson that was really popping and uh like he just he just had a had a kind of like a whole kind of movement going on too. So uh his his sound mixed with with Rich Boy at the time kind of just made it like the perfect moment. Perfect moment for the boys pit to drive and pick up their twenty thousand dollar pair of sneakers. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> Uh, every week on Entourage, you know, we talked about celebrity cameos. There weren't a ton in this episode, but there was one that I wanted to dedicate some time to. What did you think of DJ AM being in this episode? Tell me you're going to size up nowadays, AM. No dice, Turtle. I'm sorry, man. What's up, man? Just trying to get my boy some sneaks. What's up? He's doing better before you start negotiating, man. You know what I had to go through to get these? Not only do I have to spin this kid's sister's birthday party, I got to have it in my club LAX. Look. Turtle's desperate for those shoes. Anything I can do? I'm sorry, man. There's no dice. I've been waiting on these since Christmas, man. I knew about them in November. I mean, you got me there. But I got these. Later, Vince. Late. I mean, it's it's perfect. Like he's it's perfect. he's a sneakerhead. Like yep. he he's like a legit. He he was a legit sneakerhead. So for him to be there and for that moment to go down the way that it did, like that's that's 100 completely accurate like you can't like you couldn't like the only other person it could have been like maybe it was like dj clark kent or or maybe like mayor or maybe like russ bankston or something like that who are these like huge well-known sneakerheads but sure. like dj am is like the perfect guy yeah entourage nailed this 100 percent. dj am adam goldstein he was american dj from philly he joined the band crazy town in 1999 he left the group in 2001 to focus on his career as a solo dj in 2006, he accepted a $1 million contract to perform weekly at Caesars in Vegas. And by 2008, him and uh, Travis Barker formed a group. I mean, he was on the up, but, uh, you know, yeah. sadly in 2009, he, uh, he uh, died of a drug overdose. So gone too soon. Uh, RIP, DJ, DJ AM. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this episode, we always talked about, like, things that are outdated from this episode, like references made. Kind of everything that Bob Ryan says is out. Oh, yeah, is outdated. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Martin Landa. You sanctimonious little piece of crap. I put years of my life into this script. Bob, it's relax. my fucking score, Eric, and he denigrates. He has no respect. I have 50 years in this business. Time was when I'd walk into the derby, they'd kick Coppola out on his ass to get me a table. Time was there was no sound in movies, Bob. Ari, let me handle this. I guess my question overall is, if this exact plot happened in 2019, how would it be different? So a lot of it is actually pretty similar to how things happen today. Um, traffic getting to the valley in 23 minutes. Yep. Um, all, all of that, all of that remains legit. Even the sneaker, the sneaker portion is is still pretty legit. Well, I take that back. So the sneaker portion, like the waiting in line, yeah. that would have changed a little bit because everything is so online now. Yep, that's what so I was going to ask. It would like it would have been more of Turtle entering a bunch of raffles at a bunch of different stores in order to get the shoes, and probably him and Vince would have been driving around to different stores trying to win the raffles, um, or they were like online trying to get it, and he, he and Vince have like. 10 phone 10 20 <laughs> phones set up on a table and they're all like clicking all of them at the same time in order to try and get the get the sneakers because most of the stuff happens on on the uh, on the internet these days so can you explain to me the layman how the raffles work so you show up on site and you put your name in and then what happens like you got to be there when they call your name yeah, there's there's a there's a couple of different ways. You don't have to be there as much anymore to be there when they when they do it, but there's a couple of different ways. Um, so some of them are online. Like Foot Locker has an app where you can enter raffles digitally, and some nice. places have have like digital raffles where you just kind of submit your information, or they do it on Twitter, and you have to submit there, and you can and win there. But some stores you have to come down to the store and fill out a ticket and put a ticket into the raffle and they'll either call you or text you or whatever it is mm -hmm. to let you know that you won. Um, and then sometimes they have surprise drops. So like it's, it's a, it's a bunch of different, there's a, t there's a ton of different ways they do raffles, but yeah, it's, it's, all confusing and super frustrating it sounds it sounds stressful to me is what it does yeah. it sounds like an added stress that i don't need in my life but i get it i completely get it yeah it's crazy that you have to jump through all these hoops to give people your money which, <laughs> is, it's, which is something entirely different i was gonna ask there is not as there can't be as much waiting in line anymore with the uh, you know now that it's everything's uh digital early on in the episode the boys you know encourage drama to take a xanax what's the matter johnny you nervous? I've been out of real port in a long time, and uh, I got this big monologue to do. Maybe you should take a Xanax. No, no Xanax. You can't act on Xanax. You can't act when you're having a panic attack either. What would you say, panic attack? 
I haven't had a panic attack since 95. I don't need you to go putting that shit in my head. Relax, drama. You're going to kill it. I feel like at this point, if it was 2019, drama would be having some nice CBD oil, some and yeah. something edible, something that yeah, mellows yeah. them out without making them paranoid or tired. Like that bridge would be crossed. I could totally see. I could totally see if that show was happening today. I can totally see Turtle having convincing Vince to uh, to start a CBD oil company. Hundred <laughs> percent. And like he's like, no, no, take take Turtles teas or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> drink, drink some of Turtles teas and get you get yourself right before the episode. And he was like, I can't do that, Turtle. I, no, no, come on, not today, not today, bro, yeah, not, not today. today, not today, bro. <laughs> And then, I mean, let's be honest, while it's a comedic moment, Eddie Burns would be blackballed from the industry for sh having his crew listening in on an actor, like, Absolutely. masturbating. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, fuck, does anybody know what the fuck he's doing in there? I do. His mic's still on. Oh, yeah. Oh, baby. <laughs> Jesus oh. Christ. Bino, come here. You got to hear this. Yeah. Forget about it. He's rubbing one out. Unbelievable. Oh. Yeah, as soon as I saw that scene, I was like, oh, it made me think of every sound man I've ever talked to. <laughs> uh, every, every time I've been on set, and I'm like, wait a minute. They tell me that if, the, if it's not rolling, then the sound's off. <laughs> What's going on? Here? That cannot be true. Um, Okay, we're rounding the bend here. I, I always like to point out just like... Certain continuity errors, little bits and facts, you know, trivia, stuff like that. I have a question for you, Jot. All right. How the fuck did Fruity Jama make a custom pair of shoes and a custom box in the equivalent of an afternoon? Is that even possible? That is not possible. Like, <laughs> uh, um, well, you know what? Let me, let me, you know, let me pull back on that a little bit. Uh, shoe surgeon, uh, I don't know how long it takes him to put a pair of shoes together. And I know he's, he, he can probably, he can turn stuff around pretty fast. I don't know if it can be an afternoon, but probably a day, a day would be accurate though. Yeah. Like, imagine, okay. imagine a day and you know, it, it could have been something as easy as maybe he had a sample because the shoes sure. were the same. The thing, That's the true. difference was the box. So he just got a cool box out of it. Uh, but I think, I think he got the same. Fukuyama Air Force Ones. Well, I think the the ones that he was trying to get the limited release were like a uh, baby blue, and the ones he did as turtle are like a gold foil. So there's some difference in it, and that's where oh, like okay. that's where I was like, why don't they? You know, why didn't the writers just say like the next morning Vince takes turtle to you know to Fukuyama's studio? Why did it have to be that afternoon? Like it was it all happened in the course of like five or six hours, which yeah. Was... But and the, but you know, and then on the flip side here, and this this is like the sneakerhead part coming into into sure. play here. Um, generally, when they have those limited releases, they also have a friends and family version oh, of the shit. shoe that uh, that only like you know that they only make 10, 20 pairs of. They'll do like two hundred or twenty thousand or whatever of the, mm -hmm. of the limited release. But then they'll do this like friends and family release that only gotcha. goes to like close personal friends of the designer. Um, so he he could have gotten you know he could have gotten one of those with the fancy box. That must be what happened. Like he must have called Fujijama or Fujijama's people, and he said, "I got two pairs for my friends, but like if you give me twenty grand, I'll I'll give one to you." Exactly. And yeah, that's interesting. And okay, twenty grand, you can get another one made. Yeah, so. <laughs> I think so. I think Fujijama has got a lot more money to spend on graffiti. Um, True. Every week we talked about a Faces in the Crowd award. So just some actor in the background of Entourage that like you might recognize from somewhere else. I have two this week. Oh, okay. Bradley, the head of Paramount, the first uh, you know studio head that they meet, he's an actor named Jack Coleman. He's uh -huh. known for portraying Noah Bennett in the science fiction series Heroes from 2006 to 2010. Oh, wow. He also was state senator Robert Lipton on The Office. So it was two shows from like the mid-2000s that like I just remember. I remember seeing that guy and uh, yeah, just, just kind of a face to name. But I really want to talk about Futijama. Yes. Where do you recognize him from? Um, I, I, isn't it, isn't it, um, oh God, what's the name of the movie? Oh gosh. G Goonies, right? It's Goonies? Mm, close. No, it's not Goonies. Um, he's the leader of the Lost Boys in Steven Spielberg's 1991 movie, Hook. Hook. Rufio. 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 Yes. Sorry. I was like. I know, I was like, I know, I know, I recognize him from somewhere. Uh, I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that, but I mean, for you know, uh, you know, I was born in '88. Uh, I was three years old when that movie came out. I watched it a lot as a young child. It was nice. really cool to see him still getting work in uh, the early 2000s. 
Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, it's good. I love seeing like those actors that we grew up with, like seeing them like today. And it's like, it reminds you of how old you are. Um, but it also, but it also is like, oh, I remember him when he was like a kid. Like that's, that's so cool. <laughs> you Charlie? Yeah, you Jimmy? Yeah. Hey, you like my sneakers? Holy shit. Wait, you're Fukijama? Wait, you don't live in Japan? Born and raised in Glendale, my man. <laughs> I'm sorry, new kicks went so quick. But I made you an even more limited edition. Turtle's like, wait, you're not from Japan? And he's like, I'm born and raised in Glendale, my man. <laughs> yeah, which is a whole nother story. <laughs> is it really? Just, I mean, just seeing like, you have these like, people are that like in the world that are like you you assume are these like cultural icons and you mm -hmm. assume they're from somewhere and you know they're from glendale or they're from chatsworth yeah they're and from the suburbs like, hey, like you're from chatsworth like what dude i thought oh <laughs> it, it pops the bubble a little bit right like yeah you, yeah dude there's so much of that on the internet these days absolutely right? Yeah, yeah. I'm but, from I the mean, suburbs of Chicago, but I tell people I'm from Chicago, that type of thing. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I tell people I'm from L.A., but I'm from the Valley, so <laughs> yeah. you know, it's the same thing. Yeah. Every week, Jock, we give a sits man award, so just someone who came on screen, maybe not someone from the, you know, main cast, someone that just comes on and makes good use of their minutes. Do you have anyone that you want to do the sits man award to? I've got one if, if you don't. No, I don't. I don't. I mean, I mean, Martin Landau was just terrific in this, but I don't know if that counts. He's fantastic. I mean, he was in last week's episode. Of, oh, shit. Tip my mic. Um, I think we gave it to him last week. And I mean, he's obviously oh, an iconic, okay. iconic actor who like, I mean, he's kind of meant to like muck up the meetings and that's what he does yeah. uh, and kind of causes some undue stress on both the viewer of the show and Ari and E. But uh, I want to give it this week to Eddie Burns. Okay. Yeah, I'll take that. He comes on. He just keeps making drama more and more nervous. And it's almost yeah. like he's doing it on purpose, which is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Like... A little nervous? Nervous me? No, no, I'm not nervous. I feel great. Good, good. Well, you're going to feel even greater in a second because I just beefed up your monologue. You read it to my monologue? Yeah, yeah, just a couple of paragraphs. All right, just think. Three minutes, your face, and a lens. Every act is fantasy, right? Great, great. Yeah, then he's like, you know, it's a walking shot now. It's a walk and talk now. You're like, wait, what? What? <laughs> Hold on. There he is. Hey, hey Eddie, hey. I'm gonna kill this man. I'm gonna kill it. Like the confidence. Look, I want to talk to you a little bit about the blocking. Though. Blocking? What blocking? Script says I'm sitting at a table. I know, I know, I know. But I came up with a great shot. We're gonna do the whole thing on the move. On the move? Uh, I'm doing my monologue on the move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like this. Just like life. Walking and talking. It's gonna be beautiful. I, I don't know, Eddie. It's a long speech. I know, and the guys at the network don't think we can do it. But I told them we got the guy to camp. Uh, How stressful would that be on you? Oh my job? god, that gave me that it gave me anxiety just like <laughs> just watching it and thinking about it because because you know as an actor like you you kind of frame the scene out in your head, mm -hmm. um, especially when you feel like you've kind of have have an idea like this is what it is and this is what you're told, and then for changes to kind of happen at the last minute, um, it's one thing for like to improvise something, yep. but to change the structure of what you're doing and then to add like two additional paragraphs for you to, for you to learn. Like it just gives me anxiety just thinking about it. And you know, sometimes like your best work comes out of moments yeah. like that. Where yeah. You just like have to kind of wing it and do it on the fly. Cause you don't have time to really think about it and, and really deeply digest it and go through all of that. You kind of just act off of your, like your, your uh, theatrical instincts. Yep. So like you get, some, you do get some good stuff out of that, but the anxiety that accompanies that sort of moment, is next level. I'm not an actor per se, but I do do voiceover work on the side. And what's interesting is that when you do like a voiceover reading, if you have to read like a 30 second ad, you'll read it, you know, 50 times. And then when you think you're done, the director will go, okay, do it one more time. Just right now, do it really quick. And it's that last time when you're completely exhausted, when you're not thinking about it. And when you're like kind of stripped away of all uh, nervousness and anxiety and the words are just words at that point, that that's yeah. usually the best take I find. Yeah. So there's there's something there's something really true in that. I really and I want to talk about this just for a second. Like this running dad, let Johnny Drama is not a very talented actor, even though he's played by Tevin Dillon, who is one of the more accomplished actors in the cast. Right. right. It's really nicely underscored in this episode where Drama and Eddie Burns are doing a walking and talking scene while Drama's panicking about being told by Burns yep. that his character is playing a walk. It was nice. It was like. It was like a little, little bit of a meta like hat tip, like, hey, he's like drama, like just how we're doing it right now, and and he's he's doing it perfectly. 
Yeah, it was it was it was super like shout out to uh, I don't know if that's that was Doug's decision, but like you, you definitely see like the the uh, the tie in between like what they're talking about and what they're doing. And that's that, that's just one of those like filmmaking things that, you know, that you really start to appreciate as you start to really get into film of seeing what the director or the producer does uh, in order to reinforce the story, like stability, especially for someone like that's not into like if you're not into like film and theater and, and picking up on things like that you know the 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 cast or you know the director and the producer they do that kind of stuff subliminally to get you to to almost reinforce it in the mind of the layman so to see that you know to see him see them execute it that way it's like ah all right like it's kind of like hat tip to you guys like, well done well done <laughs> jot did you ever think you would be going this deep about a random 2006 episode of the hbo dramedy entourage ever uh i'll be honest i did not um <laughs> But I'm happy. I'm happy that we did because, you know, in, in my world and, you know, the Internet world, like a lot of this, you don't you don't get this deep on things. Sometimes it's really like the surface and, you know, just see this see stuff just on the surface level. So to kind of dig in a little bit is refreshing. I, I completely agree. It's 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 the reason I started this podcast. It's it's kind of fun to peel apart the layers of the show and notice the little homages to Hollywood. And uh, I really appreciate you hopping on. Let's let's do a, a few more questions, apologies, and then uh, and then we'll we'll let you go. So, okay. if there's a winner overall for this episode, who is it besides Vince? Vince can't win. He's the A list movie star. Uh, I mean, it's, it, gosh, oh, that's a good question. Um, I, how are we defining winner? Uh, that's, that's it's it's completely subjective. Who who do you think just came out on top this episode? Uh, okay, so uh, as a sneakerhead, uh, I'm going to say Turtle. Yep. Uh, Turtle wins because he's got the one on one. He's got the Fukuyamas. Uh, he definitely he won in that regard. But also, you know, on the low, I kind of I kind of vote for E uh, oh, just because like they can they continue like the, the show always showed like E was this like he was in Hollywood, obviously, because he was working with Vince. But like he never lost himself mm -hmm. uh, in Hollywood and always continued to be like the good guy and always like fighting for the little man. And to see him fight for Bob um, on this episode, like kind of reinforce that storyline of yeah. who he was and that he wasn't changing um, and that he continued to be like the, the good guy that's there to help and like his morals and all that were still intact, even though he was a part of this crazy, insane Hollywood world. Bob, I hear you. And I promise you, you're going to get everything you want as soon as we set this up. But Ari does do this every day. So what do you say on the next meeting, you let him do his thing? Okay. But for you, because you're a nice boy with kind eyes. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice boy with kind eyes. I don't know if I've ever received that compliment, but I want it now. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah, and that so yeah, you could you could say it's turtle, you could say it's E, you could also say it's drama. Drama nailed his pilot role, you know, yeah. his pilot scene. So could be any of those three guys. Uh, who knows? There we will never know because this is a subjective podcast that True. doesn't really matter. True. Was this an A list episode, a B list episode, or a D list episode of Entourage, Josh? Uh I'm gonna go with uh, a B list episode. Yeah, I'd yeah. say so. I'm going with B list episode. B plus for the strong, you know, sneakerhead subplot. The Absolutely. the stuff at the studios is a little stressful, and it's a continuation of last week's uh, drama. So yeah, another solid B. Again, this came on the heels of Vegas, which was like two episodes ago, and that episode's all time. So right. you, you just can't hold it in the same regard. I think. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to follow up stuff like that. Hundred uh, percent. Last question. I asked this of all my guests, all my first-time guests, that is, and obviously we, I hope to have you back at some point. This has been a fantastic conversation. Jock, if Entourage is real life, which character are you closest to in, in your Entourage? Uh, in my Entourage? Yeah. Uh, gosh. It's weird because, like, I see myself in bits of each of them. You know what I mean? I, I feel like I have, like, E's moral compass. I obviously have Turtle's love of sneakers. On, on one, in one hand, I'm Vince because I'm, I'm doing, like, this internet stuff. And I have sure. a million followers. And I can yeah. have all of that. But then I also, you know, live within the doubt of, uh, of Johnny Drama. Like, that's, you know, like, as you get out there and put yourself out there and you, and you want to try and do things or you miss an opportunity or you hear, like, a big pilot comes up, but then you don't get it and like all of those things. So I, I, in a sense, I feel like I'm a big piece of, of all of those guys. I'm, I'm like the fifth entourage <laughs> guy, I guess that kind of, I'm, I'm the summation of those guys all together. Um, but if I, if I absolutely have to pick one, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to push myself to E sure. um, the most just because I, I'd probably uh, I I don't necessarily need to be in the light, and I could help out. I'd rather be helping someone else achieve their dreams. 
That is the best case I've ever heard for I am all of them, which is fantastic. <laughs> fantastic answer. This was a fantastic episode. Thank you so much for coming on. No problem. Where can the listeners of Oh Yeah, Oh Yeah follow you, watch you, find you? What do you have coming up that you can uh, that you can share with the listeners? Uh, well, I'm all over the internet uh, at, at Kusto, which is K-U-S-T-O-O. Uh, the main place you can find me is on YouTube, um, but I'm also on Instagram quite a bit, and I talk a lot of trash about bacon on Twitter. <laughs> uh, so if you're into bacon, you and I can definitely be Twitter friends. Um, I have some other projects coming out. I have some stuff that's going to happen on Disney Plus that I uh, can't necessarily say about, yeah. but that stuff's coming just hustling just hustling hustling hustling. i know it man yeah. i know it we will uh we'll be on the lookout for your disney plus stuff would love to have you back on maybe when some of that stuff drops to help promote and uh talk some more entourage absolutely man thank you so much i'll talk to you soon john thank you for having me appreciate it man <laughs>